his nation's strongman, savior of Russian pride and Russian manhood. But Vladimir Putin sits astride a corrupt state. He has got so many guilty secrets, so much money has been stolen, so many people have been killed. This is a president with an astonishing past. If you put these people in the United States or in Canada and check what they've done, they're criminals. I'm Gillian Finlay, and this is The Fifth Estate. It's May 2012, and Vladimir Putin arrives at the Kremlin to be sworn in for the third time as Russia's president. It's an historic day, the culmination of a remarkable ascent from unemployed spy to modern day czar. This man has a remarkable story too. Andrei Zikov was once the city of St. Petersburg's top police investigator. In 1999, he wanted to arrest Vladimir Putin on charges of corruption. Could Putin be held criminally responsible based on the evidence that has already been gathered? Absolutely, yes. Russian scholar Karen Dawicha has come to the same basic conclusion. I mean, a whole range of economic crimes. Abuse of power, abuse of his official position, um, involvement in relations with organized crime, um, knowledge about money laundering. При осуществлении полномочий президента Российской Федерации. Like many in the West, Dawisha had assumed that Putin was a Democrat, or at least an aspiring one. A former advisor to both U.S. and British governments, Dawisha has written several books on Russian politics. Her latest turns that hopeful Western assumption on its head. I started thinking, instead of seeing Russia as a, as a democracy in the process of failing, we need to see it as an authoritarian system in the process of succeeding. That, that they're not actually incapable of being Democrats. They don't want to be Democrats. What about that? Let's work on that thesis. And if that's correct, when did that start? And that's what took me to the 90s, because they were stealing from the very beginning. Russia in the 90s was a desperate place. The certainties of the old Soviet system were gone. What would replace it wasn't clear to anyone. Least of all to a young ex-KGB officer named Vladimir Putin. In 1990, he'd returned from a posting in East Germany and was out of work. But he did have an important contact in St. Petersburg City Hall. Anatoly Sobchak, his former law professor, would soon become the city's first democratically elected mayor. When he did, he appointed Putin his deputy and, crucially, to chair the city's committee on foreign economic relations. He was the linchpin. He controlled which foreign companies could register their offices and receive offices. After all, remember, all this property was Soviet property. Soviet Union hadn't fallen yet. So how was a company going to get access to property to set up a, a branch in St. Petersburg? Putin. Putin would have to assign it. His star rose quickly, and in a hint of image-making to come, Putin commissioned a documentary about himself called simply Power. But there were many sources of power in St. Petersburg in those days, some of them criminal. Sobchak needed a person who could work in the shadows, and according to political analyst Stanislav Velkovsky, Putin was perfect. St. Petersburg called the uh, bandit capital of Russia, gangster capital of Russia. 
at that moment, and the mayor's office should communicate to those groupings some way. But of course, Anatoly Sobchak could not be involved in such contacts, and it was Vladimir Putin who was in charge. But Putin had his work cut out for him. The collapse of the Soviet system brought terrible shortages, and there was little foreign currency to buy food abroad. To fill the shelves, oil and other resources were to be bartered. In his propaganda film, the deputy mayor assured hungry residents that food was on its way. The trouble was, most of the food never arrived. As despair turned to anger, a city councillor named Marina Salye was appointed to find out what had happened. Years later, she still had all her documents and was still clear about what went wrong and who she believed was to blame. So, without going into all the details, I'll tell you from this document signed by Putin, all 124 million disappeared without a trace. Without a trace, because from this list of materials that I have listed, not a single gram of food came. And what happened was um, fly-by-night companies were set up. Many of his friends, who are still around today, were behind those companies. The goods went out, and incomplete or no shipments came back. So millions, millions were made just in that episode alone. Salye turned the case over to prosecutors. We concluded that Putin and his assistant should be fired. The city council agreed, but Subject intervened to protect Putin, and it wouldn't be the last time that the mayor and his deputy would be linked to corruption. In a monastery six hours from St. Petersburg, a man comes seeking peace. This former federal investigator is haunted by case number 144-128. Lieutenant Colonel Andrei Zikov investigated a construction company called 20th Trust, a company registered by Putin's Economic Relations Committee. His conclusion? Crimes had definitely been committed. So, two and a half billion rubles were transferred to the company's account. The way it worked was the funds were supposed to be used for specific building projects, but ended up being used for completely different purposes. The investigation tracked how the city paid 20th Trust to do work, how the work was never done, and how much of the money disappeared. In one case, he says, siphoned off to build Spanish vacation villas for Putin and his cronies. It was theft. Sobchak and Putin should have been jailed and would be in jail, undoubtedly. Putin probably first and foremost, as the greatest number of documents and orders were signed by him. Putin would not go to jail and neither would Sobchak, although his days as mayor were numbered. In 1996, tainted by yet another corruption scandal, he lost the St. Petersburg election. His widow, Ludmila Narusova, remembers difficult days. In 1996, when Sobchak stopped being mayor, as is often the case in the Russian elite, a lot of people immediately turned their backs on him. Vladimir Putin was nearly the only one that didn't do that. That loyalty would soon be tested. Under questioning by prosecutors, Sobchak apparently suffered a heart attack, was rushed to hospital and eventually right out of the country. 
In a highly orchestrated departure, the ex-mayor fled justice on a national holiday weekend aboard a private plane arranged by Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin helped me organize that, risking everything. Weeks later, Sobchak would re-emerge in Paris, looking surprisingly healthy. And Putin's reliability would be noted all the way to the Kremlin. When we come back, explosions shake a country. But who's to blame? By the late 1990s, Vladimir Putin had moved up in the world again. Now he was in the Kremlin, where crisis had set in. A sick and often drunk Boris Yeltsin was teetering his way to the end of his presidency. His administration, too, the focus of a massive corruption investigation. Having parceled out much of Russia's wealth to a band of oligarchs, allowed aides and family members to enrich themselves as well, there was fear in the Yeltsin camp about what might happen if his successor proved less than understanding. In Putin, they saw a man who protected his old boss, the former mayor of St. Petersburg. Now there was a new boss who needed help. Well, I think what they saw in him was that he had protected Sobchak. And as they said, he didn't give up Sobchak and he's not going to give us up. How vulnerable were they at the time? Very vulnerable. In 1999, Yeltsin not only made Putin prime minister, but declared him his successor. But there was a problem. Before Putin could get down to the business of protecting the Yeltsin family, he had to get elected, and Russians had no idea who he was. And so, once again, an instant biography was commissioned of the former spy. Natalia Gavorkian was one of the biographers. She now lives in self-imposed exile in Paris. Narrative that they wanted out. Just, just, he's... Everything. I mean, where he comes from, who is he, why he was in KGB, or whether he liked it or not, because everybody was speculating about KGB. Like, he was, that was the main thing about him. He's the KGB man. That's all. So what they wanted to present him, that he is a normal human being. He has parents, he had a biography. His biography tells of an only child who grew up poor and scrappy. An unusual boy who at age 16 went to the local KGB office and asked to join up. He was told to come back later. He did, with a law degree, and after training he was sent to a posting in East Germany. Once and always <coughs> KGB. Can you explain to a Western audience, what, what does that mean? Uh, they, they are the people who prefer to operate in shadow. They are the people which are uh, like state is first and people are second. All these kind of things he has in him. And uh, he cannot, I don't think he can change it, you know. It's unchangeable. Before becoming Yeltsin's prime minister, Putin had already served as head of the KGB's successor agency, the FSB. I think the fundamental point about the Putin is his KGB training. Ed Lucas is an author and senior editor at The Economist magazine. He specializes in Russian affairs. And this organization attracts a particular breed of people, tough, unscrupulous people, and it trains them in a way that makes them even tougher and even more unscrupulous. It ways, they have ways of persuading people, of bending them to their will, of playing all sorts of psychological tricks and games, a tremendous sense of self-righteousness that they alone are the true guardians of the national interest. <laughs> In the fall of 1999, the national interest appeared to be in peril. Bombs obliterated four apartment buildings in Moscow and other cities. Hundreds of people killed in their sleep. 
All of a sudden, an unknown prime minister was everywhere, the embodiment of Russian anger and revenge. Арестов везде, в аэропорту, в аэропорту, значит, вы уж меня извините, в туалете поймаем, мы и, и, и в сортире их замочим, в конце концов. Все, вопрос закрыт окончательно. Author and journalist David Satter has investigated the apartment bombings. Putin was uh, viewed by the public as the person who was avenging this horrific attack against innocent Russian civilians. Whoever was responsible for that attack had committed a horrible crime. And by placing himself in the center of the effort to avenge that crime, Putin managed to uh, gain a lot of instant popularity. His first act was to point the finger at Chechen separatists. The Russian officials said that there was a Chechen trail uh, in the apartment bombings. Not proof of Chechen involvement, a Chechen trail. It wasn't clear what that meant, but it was used in order to justify a new invasion of Chechnya. And Putin's invasion would be brutal. <laughs> In Chechnya, thousands would die. In Russia, he would become a national hero. He quickly became the most popular politician in Russia, even though before the apartment bombings, he was believed to have had no chance to succeed Yeltsin as president. If it was a strategy, it worked. Six months later, Russia had a new president, a modern man the world thought, ready to take his country into the future. But 15 years later, questions of the past still haunt this place. It's a monument to those who perished in the apartment bombings. Why they died and who was responsible have never been adequately answered. Mikhail Trapashkin was hired by one family to try. He's a former KGB officer himself and a lawyer who had his own doubts about the official story, doubts that only grew when he saw the reaction of his former security service colleagues. They were telling me, don't dig into it, otherwise you will get imprisoned yourself. And then specifically, they were telling me in a straightforward way, just leave it if you don't want to have trouble. And I was saying that, well, I'm the former investigator and I have experience and I can help. I can run my own investigation. But there would be many obstacles put in his way. The Russian government destroyed all the evidence in the case of the earlier bombings. No sooner had the bombings taken place than bulldozers showed up to, to remove the rubble, including human remains. And in that case, they destroyed the crime scene. But then something else would happen, far away from Moscow, that would cast even more doubt on the government's explanation of what happened here. In another apartment building in another town, residents notice strangers putting sacks into a basement there. The residents called the police, the police called the bomb squad, which quickly discovered that the sacks marked sugar, in fact, contained the same explosive that had been found in the Moscow bombs. It was a military-grade explosive called Hexagon. The detonator was one commonly used by Russia's military as well. But what really cemented the scandal, the strangers who'd placed the bomb. Under questioning, they admitted they were secret agents of the FSB. I think that the evidence that there was an FSB operation to place explosives in the apartment building in Ryazan is incontrovertible. To murder your own citizens as they sleep in their beds for political reasons, how do you wrap your head around that? On a personal level, I think it is an example of evil. I personally have concluded that 
It was one of the worst things I can think of. The suspicion that the Kremlin itself was responsible for killing so many has been raised in several documentaries and books and investigations. But Putin has called the charge utterly insane. In trials that were widely questioned, a number of people were convicted of the bombings, none of them Chechens or members of the FSB. Since then, it's proven dangerous to ask questions. People who tried to investigate the apartment bombings in many cases ended up dead. The list is long. Sergei Yushenkov, a Russian politician who headed an investigative committee, gunned down outside his home. Anna Polakovskaya, a well-known journalist and Putin critic, also killed in her apartment's elevator. And Alexander Litvinenko, a former SFB officer who publicly accused Putin of ordering the bombs, died in London poisoned with polonium. Each of the murder investigations remains clouded in suspicion. Sergei Markov is a longtime Russian analyst authorized to speak on President Putin's behalf. There have been a number of uh, credible investigations that have concluded that this was the work of the FSB and could not have happened without the knowledge of Mr. Putin. It was uh, no one credible investigation which shows that it had been uh, done by FSB. All this propagandistic quasi-investigation, just uh, using uh, tricks and so on. I already heard about this story, about this FSB exploded the building in the Moscow maybe hundreds of times. And all of these people, free, nobody, nobody was in jail. Don't become a victim of propaganda. It's very dangerous also. Mikhail Tropashkin knows that. He became a victim too. One week before he was to report his findings to a parliamentary investigation, he found himself pulled over at a highway roadblock. So they stopped me at a police checkpoint where there was a crowd of people. They checked my identification twice and they didn't find anything. And when I was closing it, one of the officers threw in a bag and I told him, that's not mine, why are you putting that in my car? He opened the bag and said, here is the gun, here is the gun. And I was immediately arrested. Trapashkin was sent to prison for two years. After his release, he continued to speak out about his investigation and was jailed for two more years. Well, the apartment bombings, they cost thousands of innocent lives, both Russian and Chechen, by starting a new war. Uh, they brought to power someone uh, from the security services, and that's Putin, who, of course, had no interest in democracy. The first thing Putin did after becoming president was grant Boris Yeltsin immunity from prosecution. But his administration quickly moved to ensure Putin's safety too. Case number 144128, that corruption investigation in St. Petersburg, quietly went away. The prosecutor general gave an order that the criminal case should be terminated. It was explained to us that criminal investigations are not pursued in relation to the president. Investigator Zikov can only wonder how history might have been different if he'd been allowed to arrest Russia's president. People would respect civil law because everyone would understand that if the president can be prosecuted, then, in essence, our officials would understand that the law has to be protected. As it now stands, Russia has no law. When we come back, Putin woos the West.
Of all Vladimir Putin's strategies for maintaining power, charm is not to be underestimated. He seduced Russians with carefully crafted imagery, the West with promises that he was a man they could do business with. George Bush famously came to that conclusion after simply looking into his eyes. Putin was trained in the KGB to deceive foreigners. He has a very sharp eye for human weakness. He's good at persuading people and at intimidating them. And he's been doing this with Western leaders, sometimes with charm, sometimes with threats. But boy, does he do it. If Western leaders hoped that Putin would steer Russia towards their ideals of democracy, liberalism, and capitalism, a meeting in 2003 would underscore just how wrong they were. It was an extraordinary gathering in the Kremlin's historic St. Catherine's Hall. In attendance, the nation's oligarchs, those who'd become billionaires under Boris Yeltsin, and who had their own hopes for Putin as well. The richest of them all, the man with the glasses on the left, Mikhail Khodorkovsky. I got the impression that he was our, a person of our generation. What do you mean by that, our generation? Our parents' generation, they have a totalitarian view. Even if they're against it, as opposed to our generation, we're closer to the West. But by the early 2000s, the West was cracking down on corruption. New legislation had just been passed in the United States. If Russians wanted access to financial markets, they'd have to start playing by new rules. By 2003, corruption was already the key method of state governance used by the bureaucrats, and bureaucrats started to demand the kind of money that was impossible to hide. One had to make a choice, build companies that are open, and list them or do business Russian style. In other words, pay bribes, receive privileges, but remain within a closed system. We decided the question was worth discussing. In the meeting, Khodorkovsky asked to speak frankly. As I understand it, what, what you were essentially doing with the television cameras running was accusing the president of, of Russia of running a corrupt state. I did not accuse him personally of corruption, and this is not how he took it. Yes, I did accuse his inner circle and him of creating a model that uses corruption as his backbone. And he told me that we too took part in creating that model. Мы принимали участие в создании этой модели. Мы с вами обсуждали в свое время, да? At that point, Putin turned the tables, reminding Khodorkovsky that his oil company, Yukos, was facing troubles. Надо отдать должное руководству компании Yukos, так? Она договорилась с налоговой службой, приняла все претензии и закрыла все проблемы, закрывает все проблемы с государством. Но как-то эти проблемы возникли. It was a veiled threat, delivered with a cold smile. Did I realize it would provoke Putin's displeasure? Of course it did. But I thought he would choose the European model, and I was not the only one thinking that, because it was obviously more beneficial for the country. But Putin also perceived Khodorkovsky as a political threat. He'd been funding opposition parties and spending money promoting democracy. The meeting in the Kremlin sealed his fate. Eight months later, he was arrested. His oil company dismantled and divided among Putin loyalists. Russia's richest man would serve 10 years in a Siberian prison camp. 
Today, he lives in exile in Switzerland and has no doubts about Putin's legacy. Сначала он хотел, он считал, что он сможет At first, he thought he could build a sort of a democratic model that he could control. A model like this does not exist, so he started to slide towards, at first, mild totalitarianism and then an increasingly harsh totalitarianism. If the situation develops further, he will reach a full totalitarian model. In reality, every authoritarian system is a kleptocracy. The roots of that kleptocracy have been exposed in a number of investigations throughout Europe. In Germany, a money laundering probe uncovered documents linking Putin to the mafia group in St. Petersburg. In Spain, diplomatic cables released by WikiLeaks quoted a Spanish investigator calling Russia a virtual mafia state and questioning whether Putin was implicated and whether he controlled the Russian mafia's actions. If you put these people in the United States or in Canada and check what they've done, they're criminals. Valery Morozov is a Russian construction magnate who did a lot of work for the Kremlin before going into exile in London. Corruption didn't start with Putin, he says, but under Putin, it was perfected. He changed immediately the whole system, but not changed he made it different. He made it in order. It is everywhere. It is a system. Sergei Kolesnikov is another Russian tycoon who lives in exile. He fled to Tallinn, Estonia. He's known the system from the inside and claims the corruption goes all the way to the top. Russian business entirely depends on protection. You need protection. It is called having a roof, or in Russian, krisha. And the more krisha you have, the more successful your business will be. So every businessman dreams about giving presents and gaining protection. And if you give a present to the president, it's like having God himself watching your back. Kolesnikov used to run one of Putin's gifting projects and explain to us how the scheme worked. A business puts money into a charity, in this case, Pole of Hope. Kolesnikov's company, called Petromed, then takes the money to buy medical equipment purchased from Siemens. But the profit margin is huge, around 40%, and that money gets funneled through a myriad of other companies to end up in something called Rosinvest. Before he fled, Kolesnikov says he owned 2% of Rosinvest. Who owned 94%? Vladimir Putin. All investments, all projects of Rosinvest, were only implemented if Putin said yes to it. So no activity would have been possible without his acknowledgement. So where did the money go? According to Kolesnikov, it was diverted to build a palace. And not just any palace. This multi-hundred million dollar extravaganza overlooking the Black Sea near Sochi. I started saying that I'm not happy with all finances going for this palace. And I was told, Putin is the Tsar and you are his serf. Putin, Tsar, and you are Kolesnikov believes his scheme was only one of many ways Putin made money, hidden in a labyrinth of shady structures often held by others. How much is a matter of speculation, but also some educated guesswork on the part of Moscow political analyst Stanislav Belkovsky. I started such investigations uh, more than seven years ago, and in late 2007 I published my estimate on the assets being under Putin's personal control. It was the figure of $40 billion. 
40 billion dollars, a figure that was later confirmed by the CIA, according to press reports, and that if true, would make Russia's president one of the richest men in the world. But what happens when that man no longer sits atop of the system that made him so rich? A 2007 U.S. State Department cable, again made public by WikiLeaks, reported that as he neared the end of his second presidential term, Putin was worried. He understood, according to the cable, that there was no rule of law in Russia, no way to ensure the safety of his secret assets abroad held by proxies. To leave power would be dangerous, and Russia's president knew it. There's never been a good succession model um, in the Soviet Union or in Russia. And he's very worried about uh, how he will leave power. He doesn't want to leave in a coffin. He doesn't want to go to a jail cell. Um, and he doesn't really have the mechanism to do it because he has got so many guilty secrets, so much money has been stolen, so many people have been killed, so many unspeakable abuses have happened that he doesn't really trust anyone to look after him, to, to keep him safe if he steps down from power. So in a way, he's both the master of the Kremlin but also a prisoner in it. Putin kept his proximity to power by swapping places with his prime minister in 2008. Three years later, he was pushed aside and Putin announced he'd run for president again. That brought masses of angry Russians onto the streets. And for a time, Russia's strongman almost seemed vulnerable. But the demonstrations were quelled. And Vladimir Putin would go on to win his third election in a vote widely noted for its irregularities. When we come back, Putin on the offensive. He has a very strong sense of entitlement that Russia had stuff taken away from it during the Soviet collapse, and Russia has the right to get it back. In 2012, Vladimir Putin was Russia's president again, this time with an even longer mandate. Presidential terms had been extended to six years, which means Putin could remain in power till 2024. The country he rules over is not the country he promised to build. In the cities, there is a veneer of prosperity born of high oil prices. But the economy has been pillaged, productivity little better than in Soviet times. And in the vast reaches where the majority of Russians live, conditions remain stubbornly medieval. Putin's greatest fear is that the Russians will realize that his modernization project has failed. He came into power promising to make Russia into a modern Western country. And it's still basically a corrupt backward country the bottom line, just to put it with two numbers, two numbers is all we need. The median or the midpoint wealth for the average Russian is $871, according to Credit Suisse. Very neutral report. $871 means half the population has more than that in wealth and half the population has less. Median wealth in India, over $1,000. So. The average Russian is poorer than the average Indian. So that's one number, 871. The other number is 110. 110 individuals own 35% of the wealth of Russia. They are the most unequal country by far in the world. Now, to distract from that, a very powerful tool he's got is anti-Westernism. Blame the West for everything that's going wrong. Blame the West, indeed, for the isolation and stagnation of Russia. And couple that with a very powerful propaganda machine where all the mass media is under Kremlin control. And he's in a very good position. He has a very strong sense of entitlement that Russia had stuff taken away from it during the Soviet collapse, and Russia has the right to get it back. Cue the nationalist card. In 2000, Putin waged war in Chechnya. In 2008, Georgia. 
In the last year, he has redrawn the map of Ukraine, annexing Crimea and supporting rebels in the former republic's eastern regions. It's all played well at home. On the streets where they demonstrated against him two years earlier, the invasion of Crimea had Russians singing Putin's praises. And the West, concerned about economic ties with Russia, unsure what to do. And we see a series of escalating provocations against the West going back many years. And at every stage, we try and overlook it and keep on trying to bring Mr. Putin in. We invite him to our um, summit meetings. We try and treat Russia as a normal country. And we think we're trying to calm things down. But in fact, what we're doing is we're stoking things. We're giving Mr. Putin the impression that we're not to be taken seriously. And he can continue to push us harder and harder and harder. And that's extremely dangerous. After Putin's adventures in Crimea, the United States called for strong sanctions against Russia. But in the capitals of Europe, there was reluctance. Until July, and an act of violence that would change everything. Malaysian Air Flight MH17 brought down over eastern Ukraine, almost certainly by separatists using a Russian-supplied weapon. 298 people were killed, and the West was finally galvanized to act. I demand that Russia fully cooperate with the criminal investigation into the downing of MH17. It's necessary to make it clear uh, it will not be business as usual. We're imposing Russia's aggression against Ukraine, which is a threat to the world, as we saw in the appalling shootdown of MH17. In November, at the G20 meeting in Australia, Putin was relegated to the margins of the class photo. Obama and European leaders who'd once welcomed him as one of their own now distanced themselves. At lunch, Russia's president seemed a lonely figure, and he left the summit early. But the country he headed back to was in even deeper crisis. Plummeting oil prices, a ruble in freefall, and new robust sanctions beginning to take their toll. The question now on many minds is what does Vladimir Putin do next? To some, a story from his boyhood could yet prove telling. It happened in this building where he once shared a one-room apartment with his parents. And it involved a rat that Putin had cornered. Biographer Natalia Gavorkian. He said that I learned very good, I learned forever. Don't try to push somebody into the corner. They will jump. To, because when you don't have what to lose, you just, you attack. Um, I think it's, um, it's absolutely true about himself. When he's in the corner, that's why he's dangerous. He can jump. He will not say, okay, let's talk. He will jump. Welcome back to our first show of a new year. And it's a very special year for us at the Fifth Estate, our 40th season here on the CBC. If you're interested, we've posted some of our more famous and provocative programs on our website. And we're hard at work on new shows that you'll be seeing here soon. So for everyone here at the Fifth Estate, thanks for watching. I'm Gillian Findlay. We'll be back next week. There's a story that unites each of us with every animal on the planet. It's the story of the greatest of all adventures, the journey through life. In this series, we will see animals striving to overcome the obstacles in their lives. Each success leaves each individual closer to leaving offspring. The next best thing to immortality. Life Story, a six-part series, begins Sunday at 8 on CBC. All new Murdoch Mysteries. I have found it. Murdoch Mysteries, Monday at 8 on CBC.